great to see you all again. Thank you. It was exactly a year ago that I had the great honor to, to speak with this, uh, this group. And I was with uh, Bob, yeah, to the day. And I was with Bob Lakely, uh, just to, as you know, uh, just a few days back when we were marking a time to pause and remember those who are killed in the workplace and the importance of remembering the hard work that the NDP did to get the Westray bill adopted in the House of Commons. It was a, a battle that went on for years. And even though people continue to lose their lives in workplaces, as we also know, there have never been any convictions under that law. So we've got to continue the work of educating society, owners, prosecutors, and police about the existence of that bill and what it really means. Merci beaucoup, Alexandre, de, de cette présentation gentille où tu fais un rappel de la proximité entre le NPD et le mouvement syndical au Canada. I'd also like to point out that my friend and colleague, Mike Sullivan, who's the member of parliament for York South Weston in Toronto, is here with us today. Hi, Mike. Great to see you over there. <laughs> Canada's building and construction trades are the biggest private sector industry in our country. And they employ more than a million Canadians and contribute, as you know, tens of billions of dollars to our economy and our GDP. I come uh, by, by this knowledge uh, honestly. Um, I come from a family of 10 kids, so we had to work hard uh, to put ourselves through school. And I spent four summers at the Atwater Roofing Company doing what was then called tar and gravel roofing. I know it's all been placed by new technologies today, but I was a proud member of the sheet metal workers back then. And my brother Danny is a master stonemason in Montreal. You know, your members and you don't just build infrastructure, you help build our communities, you help build our economy. You help build opportunity for all Canadians. Like any large industry, the buildings and construction trades aren't without their challenges. Demand for skilled workers. Construction industry will need 165,000 of them in the next decade. Job mobility. 70% of workers in construction trades will move to find work during their career, and that puts huge strains on family, but it also puts a huge obligation on governments to get red tape out of the way of interprovincial mobility. We need less red tape and more red seals in this country. We believe that government has a common sense role to play in supporting the women and men in Canada's construction trades and creating the right environment for this industry to thrive and prosper. In Ottawa, as Alexandre was just pointing out, we face a government that chooses crass partisanship over practical results. I'm disappointed to see that the Conservatives defeated Bill C-201. That was Chris Charlton's bill that would have given a tax credit to tradespeople and apprentices who travel more than 80 kilometers for work. Unfortunately, it was just in February that the Conservatives conspired to defeat that bill. Chris doesn't give up, by the way, and neither will we. And it's exactly the type of measure that we will bring back when the NDP forms government next year. So, as you know, the trades have been lobbying for this for 35 years because it was so important to your industry. And Conservatives, including, of course, the Labour Minister, spoke in favour of the bill in committee, but when it came time to act, they voted unanimously, all of them, against helping skilled tradespeople find work. That's called talking out of both sides of your mouth at the same time. They voted against matching skills to available jobs. They voted against easing financial burden for families. New Democrats know construction trades deserve better, and we won't stop fighting to get you this tax credit. We will get it done. Now, as you know, the Conservative government has been plagued by scandal and blatant mismanagement. And I, I want to dissipate any thought you might have that the original temporary foreign worker problem, uh, program didn't have a reason to be. It did, of course. But what it's turned into is a typical fiasco, where hundreds of thousands of temporary foreign workers have been brought in now into low-skilled jobs and are there mostly to suppress the wages, to bring down the working conditions of the average Canadian family. That's exactly the wrong thing to be doing. So we're not opposed to getting the specific skill and sometimes it's actually necessary. But as Pat Martin, my friend and colleague from Winnipeg Centre, has had occasion to point out, 
It's more often than not being used today to ensure that people who aren't member of a union are brought into a job site, even when there are duly trained Canadians available in the city, and he gave the specific example of a hospital in Winnipeg. The Canada Jobs Grant. Don't forget, the Conservatives tried unilaterally to cut $300 million from the provinces. Now, what's important to remember there is that education is first and foremost provincial. So the Conservatives had in the first move, gotten it right. They had moved most of those funds to the provinces to make sure that trade unions and others involved in that training could work together to get the best results. And then slowly but surely, they started pulling it back like a tide easing back. The problem is, that's pure wasted effort. That is red tape, and there's a bit of an irony in that because this is a government that says it doesn't like red tape. But that's what this has been all about. Who suffers? You do. The businesses that you're in do. The people who thought that they were going to be getting training suffer from that as well. You have to have a consistent vision of what this is about and make the money flow, not one eyedropper full at a time, as the minister was trying to convince you of yesterday. And by the way, it would be easy to believe Jason Kennedy's interest in what you're doing if it weren't for the fact, and you might have missed it, but I didn't because I was in the House, that he stood up in the House of Commons and with great irony and much to the laughter and the glee of his Conservative caucus friends who were standing behind him, it's quite easy for you to find it on the parliamentary records, he said he was going to come and see his brothers and sisters in the building trade, and that was a real knee slapper for a conservative minister to say to his colleagues. I do consider you my brothers and sisters, even though I have nine of my own, and I will always stand up and fight for you. <laughs> Let's remember what they did on infrastructure spending. The Conservatives promised what? They promised, quote, the largest and longest federal infrastructure plan in Canadian history. What did they actually do? It was a shell game. It was a $6 billion cut. It cost tens of thousands of jobs building our communities. The fact is the Conservatives love power, but they hate governing, and Canadians are paying the price. Well, I'm here to tell you we can do better. We must do better. And frankly, starting in 2015 with the NDP, we will do better here in Ottawa. Conservatives like to argue there's no real need for unions these days. They've chosen to attack, as Alexandre was pointing out before, collective bargaining rights, repeated back-to-work legislation. Quand on est arrivé, après la vague orange lors de l'élection de 2011, on était tout de suite pris dans la plus importante filibuster de l'histoire du Parlement du Canada, Post-Canada. Les employés de Post-Canada étaient au travail. Le gouvernement les a mis en lockout. Ils ont eu le culot de revenir au Parlement et dire « Hey, vous avez vu, ça ne travaille pas, ça prend une loi de retour au travail. » Canada Post has made a profit in 17 of the last 18 years. The only time Canada Post didn't make a profit was the year the government locked out the workers. That's when we took it on and we had the longest filibuster in the history of the Canadian Parliament. Look at the track record of the Conservatives. Every time they have a chance, they vote against Labour. They locked out the postal workers and then they said, my goodness, they've stopped working. Let's vote them back to work. That's called bad faith bargaining. I was there. I had Denis Lemney in my office during that whole time. It was extraordinary because they had deals on the table. The Conservatives kept tearing them up. They were going to send a lesson and they kept doing it. They did the same thing with Air Canada employees. This is repeat behavior. They've decided that the union movement is not only their adversary, but their whipping boy. They try to get votes out of their right-wing base by targeting you and your members. We're not going to ever let them play that game. We'll stand up to them each and every time because, as Alexandre just said before, the union movement has provided the greatest reduction in inequality in our society in the history of mankind, and you are doing work that is essential in our society. <laughs> but let's look at the facts. Let's look at the facts. We are facing the greatest inequality in terms of income since the Great Depression. While the old line parties fight to protect their own interests, middle class Canadians are struggling like never before. Over the past 35 years, so over the past generation, income has grown only for the top 20%, while it's shrunk for the bottom 80%. Four out of five people have actually seen, in constant dollar terms, their revenues drop over the past 35 years. The economy as a whole, again, in constant dollar terms adjusted, has grown by 147%. You know what's happened to the revenue of the average Canadian family in that generation? It's gone down by 
7%. If it continues this way, we will be the first generation in Canadian history to leave less to our kids than what we got it from our parents. I don't want to let that happen. I've always fought inequality. I think that's the essence of being a social democrat. And you know what? The biggest inequality in our society now is the inequality between generations, and we've got to stand up and fight it. Over those same 35 years, the vast majority, this is a measured amount, this is not an opinion, over those 35 years, what we've just described as this increase in inequality, 94% of it occurred when Liberals were in power. You heard that right. Most of the increase in inequality in Canadian society over the past generation occurred on the watch of the Liberals, worth bearing in mind. Every single time the NDP or the Bloc Québécois brought anti-scab legislation forward in the Parliament of Canada, Conservatives and Liberals got together to defeat it. So don't let them talk one way to you and not look at their track record. Look at their track record. The consistent support for working families, for worker, working men and women, and for the union movement in Canada has always been the NDP. Of course, it shouldn't come as a surprise to you. The Liberal leader has admitted that 30 years of shared Conservative and Liberal agenda has failed the middle class. But he can't tell Canadians a thing, single thing that he'd do differently than what the Conservatives are doing now. It doesn't have to be this way. As you can imagine, when I grew up in that family of 10 kids, we didn't have a lot of money to spare. I got my first job delivering papers when I was 10. I got my first job in a factory when I was 14. But even though my family wasn't rich, my brothers and sisters and I were fortunate enough to grow up in a time and a place of incredible opportunity. I was able to go to school and get two degrees without being saddled with a mountain of student debt. When I did a cross-Canada tour recently meeting people at their kitchen table, I was shocked to find out that fifty, sixty thousand dollars in debt is not unusual. I met a couple in Sault Ste. Marie, their total debt was hundred and fifteen thousand bucks. When are they supposed to buy a house that you're going to build for them? It's not good for the economy. We're, we're, we're hurting ourselves with that. And it also meant, at the time, that Catherine and I, when we got married almost 40 years ago, could afford to buy a house and start our own family. We knew that if we worked hard and played by the rules, we'd always be able to make ends meet. That gave us the freedom to devote ourselves to public service. Catherine's a psychologist who works in long-term care and palliative care. And our sons, Matt and Greg, Matt is a sergeant in the Quebec Provincial Police, and Greg is a CEGEP college teacher. He teaches in uh, the Technologies Department in uh, Engineering. Um, they both also chosen to serve the public. But that's why I do what I do. So that our children and grandchildren, so that everybody's children and grandchildren can have the same opportunities that we have. New Democrats believe in a Canada where we take care of our responsibilities today and build for the future. That means creating the next generation of middle class jobs. The NDP will work with provinces, industry and labour instead of working against them to develop stable funding for skills development to get more people trained. So glad to meet today with the building trades and so glad to see that so many of you are making room for more women in those trades. With shortages of skilled labour in many trades, we need to stop ignoring half the population. Our candidate in the Fort McMurray by-election, she drives one of those massive trucks up there and she's an emblem of what we can accomplish. We should also see that the government ensures that companies building for federal construction contracts use Red Seal trades and apprentices. NDP supports increasing West East pipeline capacity if it's done responsibly based on sound principles of sustainable development. That's called value-added jobs here. I surprised a lot of people. As a former environment minister, I surprised a lot of people when I led the fight with the uh, communications, energy, and paper workers to keep the Shell refinery in Montreal. And I, I got questioned by a lot of the environmentalists saying, well, what are you doing fighting to keep a refinery? Because I said, it's a question of sustainable development. These are Canadian resources. We should be upgrading, refining, adding value to them by creating jobs here in Canada. But we need an energy strategy and, a, and an approach fit for 2050, not for 1950. The Conservatives have been attacking environmental laws, hurting the Canadian economy and costing us thousands of jobs. New Democrats will work with building trades to create a 21st century energy strategy that creates good construction and skilled trade jobs here in Canada instead of shipping them abroad. Come 2020, six years from now, the OECD and international experts have calculated that the annual expenditure 
on the infrastructure for new green renewable energy will be $3 trillion. You heard that right, $1 trillion dollars a year around the world. Right now, thanks to things that have been done mostly in Ontario and in Quebec, we've developed a lot of capacity in solar and wind. Big infrastructure requires a lot to put them in place. All that risks being lost if we don't have a national vision for continuing that. We do. We know that we have some of the most consistent wind patterns in the world, and it has, happens to be at the latitudes where we have the largest First Nations populations. Can you imagine the win-win situation that can be for a nation-to-nation -nation approach and job creation? But you have to believe that the federal government has a role in doing that. We do. We believe that there's a common sense role for government in creating jobs, and you have to have that vision where the government takes the bull by the horns and says, we're going to get this thing done together. And I promise you, we'll be there with you with that sort of vision for job creation here in Canada. The NDP will commit to protecting the services and benefits you've relied on for generations. The conservative message to Canadians has been, you're going to have to get used to less. You see it in the reckless cuts to services and benefits that Canadians rely on, whether it be health care, employment insurance, or old age security. How can we accept? How can we accept that hundreds of thousands of seniors who built this country live in deep poverty? It's not hard to fix. How can we accept when we see the images on our TV screen that we have First Nations communities that are living in abject third world poverty? How can, we, how can we get up in the morning, look at ourselves in the mirror, and not do anything about that? How can we accept, Bill, uh, Mr. Blakeney, how can we accept that we have 800,000 Canadian children who go to school in the morning without having had enough to eat and not get up every day and say, we're going to fight this? Well, with the NDP, with you, together, we're going to work to get back to the Canadian society that created free universal public medical care. We'll make sure it's there so that no Canadian family ever has to choose between having a sick child seen by a doctor and being able to pay the rent, because all of that stands to be lost if Stephen Harper's Conservatives stay in power. On peut vous promettre un gouvernement NPD qui va protéger le système public de santé gratuit et universel. Permettre aux Canadiens de remonter la pente un peu, pour une fois, et aider les Canadiens à épargner et à investir pour leur retraite. An NDP government will protect free universal public medical health care, ensure unemployed Canadians have the help they need to get back on their feet, and help Canadians save and invest for their retirement. The very first thing we've committed to doing when the NDP forms government is restoring the retirement age to 65. I noticed that Stephen Harper raised it to 67 at a meeting of billionaires in Davos, Switzerland. It's interesting, he didn't have the guts to come into a union hall and tell your members that they didn't work hard enough, that they could no longer retire with dignity at 65. We will bring it back from 67 to 65. Your members have worked hard enough. Thank you. We're proud, we're proud in the NDP to protect the rights of working women and men in this country and to work with building and construction trades to build a better Canada. Together we can build the Canada of our dreams, not just for today, but for generations to come. Merci beaucoup. On continue. Thank you.